Hey, so I've got all these devices in my house. They all connect to my Wi-Fi network, and yet none of them can talk to each other. And even though I've got mesh Wi-Fi throughout the house, some of these devices have really short range. And some of them even require a dedicated bridge device to connect to my network. All of these require an internet connection back to their manufacturer to work properly, and so someone other than me knows exactly when I turn my lights on and off. And what happens if the manufacturer goes under or decides to stop supporting my device, or even wants to charge me? Wouldn't it be great if my switches and bulbs and sensors were able to create a mesh network and talk to each other and even work when not connected to the internet? Yeah, that'd be awesome. But wait, what about Zigbee, Z-Wave, Bluetooth, and even Wi-Fi? Didn't they each try to be that IoT radio protocol of choice? Yes, they tried, and in my opinion, didn't quite succeed in creating that one standard consumers would adopt. Those problems I have still exist, leading to consumer frustration ecosystem lock-in, and lowered adoption. So some bright folks decided we needed a couple more quote-unquote standards. One is called Thread, and the other one is called Matter. Thread is in many ways really similar to Zigbee. Both use the same underlying 802.15.4 radio technology for Mac and 5, and therefore have the same throughput, frequency, and mesh capabilities. In addition to native IPv6 support and a slightly better security stack than Zigbee, Thread has a different and maybe better way of routing packets that allows for dynamic changes in the network leader, which should improve overall network resiliency. On the other hand, the Zigbee protocol is tailor-made for 802.15.4, and so it's more efficient both in terms of power and latency. It also specifies many, if not all, the messages passing on the network, allowing for better standardization across devices. And then there's the matter about matter. Matter is a compatibility standard, allowing some basic interoperability between devices connected together via Wi-Fi, Ethernet, Bluetooth, and especially Thread. It's that one standard to rule them all. The thought is that if it's easier for consumers to be able to interconnect devices, more people will buy more devices and everybody wins. I'm not really sure about that. I haven't personally seen any Matter devices, and I have some doubt that companies are going to be enthusiastic about allowing their devices outside of their walled gardens, but we'll see. However, this is a video about thread, so let's start exploring what we need to do to make some thread devices. Or is that sew some threads, weave some fabric, um, I don't know. I wanted to make a sensor board for home automation uses, and as the title of the video says, I packed a bunch of sensors into a relatively small board. For context, this board is 64 by 25 millimeters, or about one inch by two and a half inches for our American friends. My main goal was to make this board battery powered, and while I chose to make the first version powered by AAA batteries, I wanted to have the option in the future to use a much smaller 2032 coin cell and make the boards that much smaller. So all the sensors were chosen to be as low power as possible, as well as to work with the voltage range you can expect from a coin cell. But I also wanted to support wall power options for some of the use cases. Needless to say, I spent a lot of time on DigiKey's website, and I really missed those DigiKey catalogs. Each of the sensors was included for a specific scenario. Let me review them quickly. We have a bunch of doors in the house. Some are the swinging type, some are sliding, and a couple are garage doors. We also have some windows that open. I want to be able to see if those doors or windows are open or shut, and a simple way to do that is to mount a magnet to the door and a magnetic sensor to the door frame. I've got a couple of choices here. I could use a magnetic read type switch, which is a mechanical switch whose contacts close when close to a magnet, or I can use a Hall effect sensor, which is an electronic component that can sense magnetic fields via the Hall effect. I actually put pads on the board for both, as well as a little two-pin connector for remote sensing. I probably should have just used the Hall effect sensor though. It's got a push-pull output and it consumes about half a microamp, which is about what a pull-up resistor would draw for the reed switch, and it's much more sensitive than reed switch, meaning it will sense a magnet from much further away. The next big requirement was temperature sensing. I wanted to know what the temperature was around the house as well as outside, and I wanted to know with some accuracy. This temperature sensor has an accuracy of about 0.2 degrees Celsius. It's got a really low sleep current as well. Its only drawback is that its current can go as high as 1.5 milliamps during a measurement, but the measurement time is only about 2.5 milliseconds in the mode I'm using. I also just found a cheaper, lower power, and more accurate sensor that can also measure humidity. I'll probably use that one on the next board rev. Next up, a motion sensor to detect those burglars that come in through the chimney. Panasonic has been making these for years and they work really well. This particular unit consumes 6 to 12 microamps, 
which means the battery life might be a little shorter than what I wanted, but probably still good enough. I'll show you how to do power simulations later in this video. I know some of you are going to ask, why don't you just apply power to the sensor when you need to make a measurement and then turn it off? In the case of this sensor, it takes about 10 seconds for it to stabilize after power is applied. Plenty of time for a would-be thief to evade detection. I also don't yet know how pet friendly these are, but you can mask part of the sensor so it doesn't see the ground. Or short thieves, I guess. I've got a washer and dryer, and they get used a lot, especially on a Sunday night when everyone is trying to do laundry for the week. I really want to know when the washer is done so I can throw a load in. I thought I might be able to use either a 3-axis accelerometer to detect the vibrations of the machine, or a 5-channel light sensor and a fiber optic cable to sense the light that says the machine is done. The light sensor is pretty cool. It can measure red, green, and blue light, as well as infrared and white. I decided to populate both the accelerometer and the light sensor. I suspect I can use either sensor for a bunch of other uses, like detecting when my kids haven't turned the lights off throughout the house. Next on the list addresses my fear of coming home to a flooded basement. I put in two water sensors. These are based on a dual low power comparator with an integrated reference voltage. Simple and works well. Two more to go. I wanted a distance sensor so I could figure out if a car was in the garage. I'm using a small time of flight sensor from ST with an adjustable field of view, able to measure the distance to an object that's about four meters away. It uses about 16 milliamps of current when ranging, so I probably wouldn't want to operate this on battery power. I could also imagine using a sensor like this to measure the amount of water in a sump pump to detect if a sump pump fails. There are probably a bunch of other uses as well. The last scenario I envisioned was determining if a smoke alarm was going off. I used a small digital MEMS microphone that outputs a pulse density modulated representation of the audio it's hearing. There's the microphone, amplifier, and analog to digital conversion all in one package, which is super convenient. Not so convenient is the conversion of the PDM signal into a more traditional sampled audio format, so I can do things like sound level thresholding or even an FFT on the signal. But luckily, I found a library for that. I was even able to make a small USB microphone with this board, just for fun. So those are all the sensors. Most of them use I2C and so are easy to interface with. But I also added a few other things. There's a small LED just for debugging and a small push button switch just in case I needed one, maybe for registering the sensor to the network. Lastly, I put in a very small relay. I was imagining wanting to be able to open and close my garage door with my home assistant. As I said earlier, I wanted this to be battery powered, so I put in a small battery holder and a MOSFET for reverse battery protection. I also put in a small two pin external power connector and a voltage regulator that works up to 17 volts, though I now realize the capacitors on the regulator won't go that high. Oops, I'll fix that on the next rev. The design also has a micro USB connector for both optional power and communications. Wow, that seems like a lot. And I haven't even talked about the microcontroller powering this thing yet. I've been using the STM32F microcontrollers from ST for years now, and probably have a few dozen designs under my belt. So when I started looking for a micro for this project, I went to ST, did a search for thread, and found their STM32WB55 series. It's got an ARM Cortex-M4 paired with a 2.4 GHz RF transceiver that supports both Bluetooth and IEEE 802.15.4 Phi and Mac. It also has pretty much all the peripherals you'd want, making it really easy to interface to all these sensors. The architecture for this series of chips is interesting. It's a dual core chip. The main processor is a 64 MHz Cortex-M4 with a floating point unit. The second core is a Cortex-M0 Plus that runs the radio. They communicate through a mailbox system. The kicker is that ST provides no documentation for the M0 core and only provides encrypted binary files specific to the end use. Those binaries surface up an API to the M4 application core. Even worse, the size of those binaries is such that only the Bluetooth stack or the base 802.15.4 stack fit on the smallest memory version of the micro, which is 256 kilobytes. The Thread and Zigbee stacks are too big, and guess which version of the micro I got. Shame on you, ST, for advertising chips that really can't support the protocols you claim they do, and shame on me for not verifying the size of the required firmware. However, putting that aside, with the STIDE, I was able to map out which I.O. pins I needed to make sure they were all available. And then I was able to make sure all the clock frequencies worked. This chip has a number of internal RC clock, but needs at minimum an external 32 MHz crystal. I checked that the power consumption was about what I expected by using this tool. 
Here I'm selecting a AAA battery as the power source and then configuring two batteries in series. You can see that most of the time the microcontroller is sleeping and only waking up to transmit occasionally and for a short period of time. The simulation says that the battery should last for almost 12 years, which I don't really believe, but that's what it says. And the RF part was pretty simple. Just a 2.4 GHz chip antenna and a little filter and impedance matching network that ST cells conveniently packaged in a chip, specific to this series of RF micros. Layout was a matter of following standard RF practices, which I'm sure I got somewhat wrong, and following the datasheet recommendations. The first thing to choose is whether you want to use a two-layer or four-layer board. Four layers is just easier to route and is only marginally more expensive. You next have to consider that the RF and USB tracks should be routed on an impedance controlled board. You can select this option at most PCB fab houses. You can also select the layer stack up, which will affect the width and spacing of the controlled impedance tracks. On this board, those would be the RF traces and the USB traces. The output impedance of the RF pin on the micro is 62 ohms and the antenna requires 50 ohms. The filter acts as that impedance matching network. I use this PCB calculator from Saturn PCB Design to determine the trace width and spacing. It's pretty simple. You just transfer the numbers from the PCB stack up to the tool, select the type of trace, and then play around with the spacing and trace width until you get the desired impedance. Here I'm using a coplanar waveguide which surrounds the trace with a ground plane, and so I get 0.185 mm trace width and 0.2 mm between the trace and the surrounding ground plane. I can do the same thing to calculate the trace width and spacing of the 90 ohm differential pair for the USB connector. SD provides a good app note that lists some of the other design considerations, which include ground plane design and stitching ground planes with VS space about one tenth of the wavelength apart. So, those are the hard parts. The rest of the layout is pretty standard. Once the boards come back from the fab, I manually solder the parts on. I prefer populating a section at a time as that allows me to power up each section individually. I also don't have to mess around with solder paste. So I'm going to leave you here with the demonstration of the magnetic sensor on the left, sending a message to the base router on the right whenever the sensor changes state. This is all running over the 802.15.4 stack. In part two of this series, I'll go over the thread software stacks. Until next time.